Welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. We're here with Dr. Doreen Grampiche. And for those of you who don't know, she is, I believe, the preeminent expert in autism in our time. And there is no other time but now for autism, right? Thank you so much. Well, you've been working in this field for more than 30 years with all kinds of individuals who are on the spectrum and not just individuals who are on the spectrum. You founded CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Mm -hmm. um, you have a wealth of knowledge in this field. And, and more than that, I, I think you have the biggest heart for the entire community. And you are, without a doubt, the person that is the best that I am aware of at perspective taking. So <laughs> when we get uh, an opportunity to talk to you, we're hearing about what, you, with compassion and perspective taking towards what is the family going through, what is the individual who's on the spectrum going through, what, you know, how do the people treating the individual, what are they going through and how can we maximize the experience for everyone so that more can get done. And I Absolutely. thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the life that you live and that you lead, and we all benefit from that. Thank so we you. thank you. And we thank you for taking this hour, uh, whenever you have availability on Wednesdays, to be with us and to answer viewers' questions. And we do like to give a disclaimer at the start of the show that there is no expert mm -hmm. in, in any field that could give individual specific advice in this particular format, right? Because you don't get an opportunity to meet the individuals right. that you're talking to. Uh, but having said that and making sure that everybody understands that clear baseline um, that we can't, there, there can be nothing here that's individual specific. You give us wonderful, it's like taking Thank a master class. Oh. Uh, it's <laughs> just so, that, it is. To be able to, you know, take a tour of your beautiful mind and say, so what, what are your thoughts on this is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Thank you very much. I enjoy being here. Well, we enjoy it when you're here. So I want to jump right in and we've got some questions. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you guys can be writing in questions live. I've, I've got some to start that we had stocked up because you haven't been with us for a couple of weeks. Um, and, and that's just a reality that sometimes you have to be other places with other people. And we have to allow that because mm -hmm. we can't be stingy with you. Um, but in any case, so I want to jump to this question from our West Virginia mom. Okay. Uh, hey, Shannon and Dr. Doreen, West Virginia mom here. My son is three and a half and is absolutely terrified of the potty. I'm not sure if he's ready to toilet train yet as he's never shown any interest and still has to be changed at night. How do I know when he's truly ready and how do I combat the fear and get him interested in toilet training? I'm using skills currently, but when it comes to toilet training, regardless of reinforcer, et cetera, he is just flat out scared. My family has been on me about the fact that he's almost four and not trained, mm -hmm. but I don't want to force him and scare him even more. <coughs> How do I handle it? And thanks for all you guys do. We love y'all and we love y'all back. Yeah. This is a, a pretty common thing with kids, and it's a great question. We appreciate all your questions always, West Virginia Mom. Yes. Because I think these questions just, uh, the answers will hopefully help other people as well. Uh, I'm going to throw out a bunch of suggestions. Feel free to pick and choose what you would like to do. Uh, in general, when we do toilet training, uh, yes, he's ready. You can do it anytime. You can do it anytime. So um, I have toilet trained kids as young as two. So I mean, you, you can definitely do it now. When we potty train, we start out by making the bathroom the most reinforcing environment possible for the child. So that means you would uh, bring a TV in there, like have all of the favorite toys in there. I mean, throw a party in there. We're we always talking. say party in the potty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like uh, make it a massively reinforcing environment and make it the only massively reinforcing environment. In other words, if you want to watch TV, that's the only place you can watch TV, not anywhere else. If you want like balloons and whatever it is, that's where you go. So the first step is just to make your son comfortable with the bathroom because if he, I, and I don't know if he has a fear of the bathroom in general or just sitting on the toilet because a lot of kids have a fear of sitting on the toilet because A, they're afraid they're going to fall in, 
and B, they don't know where things go. And it's just sort of like, you know, what happens when something goes down the drain? It's a scare. And C, a lot of our kids on the spectrum also are afraid of the sound of the flush. So there's a variety of things that could be causing him fear. Uh, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, you do two things, obviously, is you make the environment, um, you you condition the environment to more pleasant things so that, uh, uh, you know, all the aversive feelings of fear go away and are replaced by positive feelings. But there's certain things that you just, you know, what are you going to do? There's actually a hole in there and it is a little bit scary. So one of the things that we used to do with our kids is that we would start by using a uh, just a plastic potty that it does not have a hole so that the child can actually and you know he may not even want to sit on there initially but what you do want to do is like ha actually show him how things can be liquid can be poured in there for instance you'll take a cup and he will actually pour the liquid in there and it'll just stay and then <clears throat> you can teach him to take the liquid and throw it in the toilet and then do the flush like <clears throat> excuse me, give him a little bit of control over the process. And then gradually, what you do is you will have him sit and go on the little plastic potty, empty it in there, and then there are these potties where you can actually take the top of the potty and put it on the toilet so it looks like, it's, so the bottom take, is taken off and yeah. you just transfer it. And then once it's transferred, the children are usually pretty comfortable with it at that point. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can do to make him comfortable with the actual toilet itself. You can definitely like play with, uh, you know, like show him how you could put colors in there. Um, and, you know, obviously you don't want to throw objects down there because he could learn that too. But just to get him a little bit more comfortable, I don't know if it's the sound of the flush. If it is, you need to give him headphones so he can avoid that loud sound or put a quiet flush in there. Um, and if it's just being able to put things down, you know, like one, if, he, if his fear has to do with things going down there and where they go, you just give him a little bit of control and show it to him and don't necessarily have him sit right away. Like this is a shaping procedure. So you'll, it'll be weeks, you know, you'll do one day at a time and have him, you do the toilet training procedure, which I recommend you do Fox and Azrin, which is in a lot of books. You can find it online as well. I think we've talked about it before yes. on this show. Uh, what you do is you just simply put that, you, you do that procedure, but you do it using the, the plastic little potty that does, that has a bottom so that he can actually see everything. And then you gradually transfer from the plastic body to the larger uh, toilet. And this will be a while. And he needs to be very, very comfortable in that room. And it needs to become a room that he wants to go to. And then what you'll do after a while is, hey, if you want to watch the TV, you need to use the bathroom first. And then over some time, what you'll do is you'll uh, just, you know, allow, move things back into the living room and get things normal again. Now, it doesn't have to be a TV. It can also be things like you want access to an iPad. It's the only time you're going to get it is, is if you go to the bathroom. So you, you put some pretty heavy-duty, high-level reinforcers into the bathroom and, and use the Fox and Azrin procedure and use a potty that has a bottom. Okay. And that should work. Fabulous. I just a couple of things because I know legal legal will be mad with me <laughs> sure. if I don't. When you're taking electronics and things into the bathroom, sure. make sure that you are supervising that because it's a place where there's water and things Absolutely. like that. And you want to make sure that you're not leaving the child alone in the bathroom with those electronics. And you also have to be watching because our kids um, have they, they love the whole idea of throwing the iPad or the iPhone into the toilet. We've That's had right. many people write in and talk about that. So you be know careful with be all very that. careful and uh, you know have things enclosed in whatever you have to have it is uh, a supervised procedure and it is yes. a little bit lengthy too it's not like you can just put them on the toilet and that's that you need to go through the procedure it's a we used to do this procedure over the course of like three days I think and you're with the child the entire time yeah. We, uh, I, I will just say this, we, there were a lot of similarities here. Jem was uh, at a certain point afraid of the toilet and, and we didn't know for the longest time what it was, but I think it was a combo platter of the idea that 
Uh, he had seen a toy go down the drain mm -hmm, once, and so mm -hmm. he was afraid of things being flushed away and being gone forever. And I honestly think there was something about when things left his body, mm -hmm. they, he felt like they were still his. Mm -hmm. And so it went into the toilet and it went away. And, and so That's it right. made him think that he could go away. Um, so, you know, it took a while, but we did the, the potty chair that eventually you clip onto the toilet seat that that super duper helped. Um, and we made our bathroom the party. I mean, this is this is the deal that they, they do this with kids all the time. And we brought in one of those little, we had the therapy chair in our house, the mm -hmm. little yellow therapy chair. Mm -hmm. And so he would be on the potty and we would be on the little yellow therapy chair and we would be reading books to him. Absolutely. And he had our undivided attention with everything he could possibly like in that room. That's right. And and you know, it's, it's a fond memory now. I remember at the time being like, uh, is this ever going to work? Um, but it was just, it was an intensive period of time, but mm -hmm. like three, four days. And yeah, then, it's three, and four then days. It, but it's three, four days that you'll remember. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're living in the bathroom. Right. But then you get the rest of your life with a potty trained child. Yeah. yeah. So um, just know, have, I always think that there's a certain amount of anxiety in parents because mm -hmm. we don't know if our child is ever going to be potty trained. Right. We just don't know that. And here's what I love about being around ABA experts is they all know that your child is going to be potty trained, that it's of just course. a matter of, you see that of, of course, course thing. Like, I love hearing no that. question. Like, that is a very easy procedure and it's an important procedure because I think it's one of the first things that allows the child to have some control. Yeah. And it's a very important procedure to be done right because otherwise the child could you could the child could develop an caprices, you know, and want to hold their bowel movement. Uh, I forgot to say something as you were saying this. One of the things that you can do is if your child is voiding in a diaper, actually have him empty the diaper into the potty as well, either the plastic potty or the toilet. But these are the types of things that are important because he can actually see what is intended and he has control over it. Fear is always about not having control. So, you know, giving him a little bit of control in the process will always help. Oh gosh, I, it's funny how sometimes you hear something and you go, oh my gosh, yes. Fear is about not having control. Mm. Man, did you just hit it on the head there. We'll be talking about la that later when we talk about back to school. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? I oh, just yeah. so heard that. Uh, okay, but, but just be confident in the fact that you are going to get past this and the and the fact that your family I just did a, a talk yesterday and one of my favorite phrases is that other people's opinions of my parenting is none of my business. Yes, yeah, so true. So if your family is giving you 68 kinds of whatever about when and how your child is potty trained just think of that as white noise in the background that that you know I, I just want to go up to those people and say thank you for having an opinion and that's the end of the conversation. Right. right. That has nothing to do with anything. Your child is going to be potty trained. And when he is, and you're ready to say, I'm going to put aside four days. Yes. Because it's really about when we're ready, right? It's 100% about when you're ready. I, I completely agree. And I just, you know, reread that section that says my family has been on me about the fact that he's almost four and not trained. But I don't want to force him and scare him even more. And that's a really, really important statement because... You know, when I was, when my kids were young, my son had developed, I think I've mentioned this, like a bunch of different fears, which were just, you know, random things. Like he was in Europe one time with someone and it was, they were on a playground and it was, it started raining and the person picked him up and started running back home mm -hmm. as a game, right? And he just suddenly got terrified of rain mm. and thunder because we don't have that in California. Yeah, He'd really never experienced it. And he was like, what is going on? And the sound of thunder to begin with is scary anyway. So it all got associated with rain, rain generalized to water. It became a fear of the ocean. Eventually it became a fear of baths, swimming pools, you name it. Like it just became a major thing. So for me, it was, and that was just one fear. I mean, he had other fears as well. But for me, it was like, okay, it wasn't a matter of allow, like not wanting him to get more scared. For me, it was a very clear that he's limiting his universe and I need to expand his universe for him and I need to get him over this fear. And that's what you're doing. You're not scaring him even further. You're teaching him how to overcome this fear. And you need to be ready, as Shannon said, because 
it's a little traumatic for the parents because the child will be crying, screaming, whatever it is initially, and you'll have to gradually get him through it so that very small steps he realizes there's nothing to be afraid of. You know, and it's a process. It took me one whole week. I remember we went to Hawaii and I one whole week of just taking one further step towards the ocean until the last day we were there, he was swimming in the ocean. And it took the entire week working with him every single day. And that's an intensive week, but you gave him the ocean for the rest of his life. His life, that's right. So, you know, that's what we have to remember. The, 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 the four days that you devote to this, it's going to be intensive and you need to be prepared and not have to go to the grocery store or have meetings or have to leave the house or whatever. Um, but once you get your mindset on about, you know, sometimes we call it potty boot camp mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. That it's like, okay, my whole life for this four days is going to be this. Um, but but within that, remember that as much as it's a thing for you, you have to make it as fun for him as possible. But once you do that, your child is going to move past this and it's going to be for the rest of his life. And that's a gift that you give your child. So, right. um, And then just to kind of like go back and clarify, I want you to spend a few days trying to make him comfortable with the bathroom and comfortable with uh, just the the plastic body and then do the procedure okay because right? the procedure itself takes two days three days it's a sort of a reverse shaping procedure uh, and you can do it but I kind of I, I don't ex I don't think you should do it if he's really terrified of the bathroom as well okay like get him familiar with the bathroom first and they have those they have those wallies they call them wallies they're stickers that you can put up for a short period of time and they don't harm the wall and they come down you know you can have toys that are you know you can have a board there a dry erase board where he can draw on it whatever he likes yeah whatever the thing is uh, and I know people get grossed out about the, about the idea of food in the bathroom but we, we had treats in the bathroom oh yeah you're gonna need you know, treats uh, for sure so like you know you're gonna need a bunch of stuff that he can't otherwise get. It's all gonna be like limited right. to the that time the, frame. The the bathroom is the party palace. Yep. <laughs> all right, we're gonna take a short break, and then we're gonna be back with more of your questions. Stick with us. Welcome to Smarty. This month, we're gonna be making our own chore spin wheel. You'll notice when we make this fun activity these icons are gonna be popping up onto the screen. These correlate to specific skill sets that are in the Skills program. Skills is the ABA-based online tool that helps parents build their own teaching plan for children on the autism spectrum. If you are a Skills user, this will help you get the most out of this educational opportunity. Well, let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are a large bowl to trace, cardstock, scissors, a pencil, a ruler, a hole puncher, a metal brad, and any other arts and crafts materials you want to use to decorate your pinwheel with. So step one, you're going to take your large bowl and place it on top of the cardstock and trace the circle. Step two, you guessed it, you're going to take your scissors and you're going to cut along the line. Step three, you're going to fold the circle into quarters. This is the best way to make sure all the triangles within it are symmetrical. Once you fold the paper, you're going to take your ruler and you're going to trace those lines so you can actually see them on the circle. Now here comes the fun part. Take your arts and crafts materials and you're going to decorate the chores pinwheel. I use some crayons to color in every other quadrant so you could see them pop and see the difference between the different chores. Place the different adaptive skills your child is working on in the different quadrants. Once you're done decorating the circle and labeling the different chores in each quadrant, then you're going to take your scrap paper that you had left over and you're going to cut an arrow out of it. Once the arrow has been cut, you're going to take your hole puncher and hole punch on the very edge of it. This will be your spinner. Then you're going to take your arrow and your circle and line them up and take your brad and place it through and secure it. And voila, you have your finished chore spin wheel. Well, I enjoyed making this activity with you and I hope to see you soon. Until next time guys, craft on. To find more about skills and to access all of the lessons you saw in today's Smarty, visit skillsforautism.com and click on the parents icon. Skills, the online autism solution. 
Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. We're here with Dr. Doreen Grampichet, and she is answering your questions right now in real time. You can be writing in on Facebook Live, on our YouTube channel, or on our live feature, which is at autism-live.com. Uh, the next question that we have, hello, I have a question about age-appropriate play. How do you tell if your child simply prefers playing with certain toys versus being rigid slash stereotypic play. Uh, my five and a half year old daughter will only play with toys that she can reenact scenarios she's witnessed. Babies, dolls, kitchens, cleaning, etc. I recently took her to a toy, toy store and asked her to pick something other than babies. We have over 50. It caused her extreme anxiety and when I offered suggestions, her answer was, I don't want that. I don't know how to play with that. I'm not sure if this is an issue I should push or if she just prefers only playing with babies and thanks for any input. That's a great question. And um, I love parents who give me so much information. Yes. That's a very good, good. You've given a lot of detail. So um, my first response is whenever you have a child who like uh, cries and shows extreme anxiety and all of that sort of stuff, then you know there's a little bit of inflexibility uh, or rigidity and I think that it is a little bit uh, something that you should deal with so you know 50 babies is probably enough <laughs> and um, I and again it's it's uh, so it's, we want to teach her it's pretty obvious we want to teach her how to play with other things and I think that is where the key is, and she's told you, I don't know how to play with that. So we need to teach her some other stuff. Uh, she might always have a preference, but as long as her preference isn't you know, so inflexible that playing with anything else is impossible. Uh, so what you do is you uh, get some other stuff and uh, teach her, like play with her and say, well, this is what we do with blocks. Let's build something together, and that'll be a lot of fun. And let's say you'll do something else like, uh, you know, get her a, a drawing kit or something and you'll produce crafts together. Uh, all that kind of stuff. Now, so you, as you teach her, obviously, it should uh, reflect in her behavior and she should start actually doing some of the stuff that you've worked on together. We teach our kids toys. We teach them how to interact with toys. Some of our kids are like very, very limited to you know, just trains or uh, just certain types of cars or that sort of stuff. So you wanna give your child a variety of things. Um, having said that, it's interesting and awesome to see that the, the stuff that she prefers is imaginative play. So you know, pretend play as a whole is a pretty cool thing and it's something that usually is lacking in our kids. So the fact that she wants to do things like cleaning and feeding the doll and all that sort of stuff is perfectly good. It's good stuff. She just needs other types of play as well. And by the way, she's five and a half. So yeah, so she's at the point you can start doing a lot more uh, of types of like, you, you can do dress up with her. She'll probably like that. Uh, you, she should be doing some uh, play that involves producing a product. So crafts, uh, building stuff, you know, those types of things, maybe even producing necklaces or bracelets with beads, all that kind of stuff. We, I love Lego Friends, which is the line of Lego that is, it's supposed to be more unisex, but I, you know, little girls are really attached to it. They have little kits that, uh, you know, uh, remind me of, I can't think what the name of it. It wasn't Shopkins, but there was like the little dog things. It was Pet Shop or whatever. Oh, I know. The, yeah, you know what yeah, I'm talking yeah. oh, about? Oh, sure, sure. It's kind of like that. Like they, you know, you can get one that's a little flower cart. Right. And one that's, you know, the pet groomer and right. things like oh, that. Oh, that's nice. And, and they have to build them and follow instructions mm -hmm. to build them. And it's those visual instructions um, that everybody is going to need later on. Um, and they're super duper fun and... Uh, I, That's really good, actually, yeah, to, because following instructions like that is also a very yeah. important skill. And, and they, if you ever have the opportunity to go to Legoland, there, uh, there are characters, there's a whole area of Legoland that is now devoted to the friends. Oh, and nice. it's these girls who sing oh, and nice. they, they, and they all, they're very ethnically diverse. 
Um, and we, we just got to go there with my two little grandnieces and it was a good time. That's awesome. So really fun for them to play with those, but there's, it's, it's amazing. I love one of the things that, um, that Carr did was at a certain point, once they had taught my son a bunch of different toys to play with, mm -hmm. to get him ready for kindergarten, then they set up PlayStations. Stations, yeah. And Stations isn't, that's in skills, isn't it? Yes, if it that is. Lesson. Yeah. And, and. It was fun and exciting for us because they made it fun. And mm -hmm. it was a thing of, you know, here's the timer and we're going to play with this for 10 minutes. And when the timer goes off, we're going to run, 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 and we're going to go over here and we're going to play with this right. for 10 and reset the thing. And eventually Jem would say, you know, timer, you know, because he got into the whole timed aspect of it. But it so got him ready for when he changed stations, oh, totally, transitioning yeah. in yeah. kindergarten. Yeah. It didn't matter that all of a sudden he was transitioning from a craft project to sitting and, you know, hearing a story. He was just like, oh, I know what this is. We change from one thing to the other, and it's right. really exciting. Right. It I is, can't wait to is. see the unveil of what we're going to do at the next place. Absolutely. And it is fun. And that's, a, that's a really good way to get the child to do a bunch of different things. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and and I, I see now... Um, I would I would tell you quite honestly that I have not been the mom who's kept up with that mm -hmm. incredibly well, um, and I hear, but I do see how even that early training has has served him well because he'd rather just play video games now, sure. right? Sure, I mean, but, every child is going to have a preference. Yeah. you know, we have preferences, of course. But there still are times when we'll say we have to stop playing video games because we have to go do this, and he right. still transitions fairly well. Mm -hmm. Where I have friends who are like, no, my kid doesn't want to do anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that early PlayStations thing, I wish I'd kept up on it a little bit more. But, you know, I, we, we can't do everything perfect. Yeah, no. And it's not, you're always, you know, the older you get, the more you choose your own preferences and the more you spend time. Like, I'm not going to do a bunch of stuff that I would have done earlier. I don't, yeah. I'm very limit, like I limit myself to certain preferences when I have free time. Mm -hmm. Um, but having said that, you look at our kids. I mean, yeah, it's just important that you teach them a variety and that they don't get too rigid about one thing or another so that they can transition out. And again, it's that expanding their world. It's a That's gift it you give to mm -hmm. them uh, that lasts a lifetime because we all have to have those leisure activities. A lot of times parents, I was oh, one of them, I was is... like, we don't want to work on play skills, we want to work on being able to communicate. But, right, but you gotta have Actually, the play skills. And that's so important. It's one of the, it's interesting because I always, I'm shocked. I was, a few, several years ago, I was doing a presentation on, on uh, teaching adults various skills, you know, and I was looking at, for an organization in Arizona, and I was looking at, uh, did some research on, on uh, leisure skills that our adolescents and adults participate in. And I would tell you, like, across all disabilities, like we're talking either other disabilities like mental retardation and uh, learning disabilities and Down syndrome and you name it, they all develop leisure skills. Individuals with autism, unless you specifically really work on it and teach it to them, they will not have leisure skills. Now, if you don't have leisure skills, so much other stuff happens because bad stuff because you, you have to realize play it's interesting i was talking to i don't know if you've ever had daniel on our on this show he's fascinating our one of our psychologists dr daniel oakley we keep talking about it i need oh, to have him fantastic i love he him is, he's amazing. i just love listening to him because he's so I, I miss being a psychologist when I talk to him because I'm so infused in the world of behavior analysis and right. he's such a great psychologist and he was just telling me, we were talking about daydreaming, and he was saying that, you know, we all have different ways that we escape, and uh, daydreaming is one of them. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, sometimes a child will think they're not attending well enough because they're daydreaming, but the truth is, daydreaming is a much better escape than various other bad habits that adolescents sometimes will, you know, an adolescent who, for instance, turns to alcohol or drugs is trying to escape whatever it is. And we all need to escape. We yeah. all have stressors. We all need to have moments where we can escape to a fantasy land that is more enjoyable. And the truth is, uh, you know, teaching your child a variety of games, leisure activity, is a, a very productive and positive way to escape. As of, and if they don't have those uh, leisure skills, uh, they're gonna turn to other things. Yeah. And you know, I, I look at my daughter, 
uh, my son, his main leisure skill is writing, but my daughter, youngest, Charlie, she just has like a million leisure, <laughs> like honestly, a million, and she just teaches herself stuff. She's like, you know, I'm gonna learn knitting, and then before you know it, she's knitting everything for everyone for a year. The next year, I'm gonna do sewing. I'm gonna teach myself piano. I'm gonna do, and it's like she's constantly doing that, and it's fabulous, and yeah. it's a way for her to just, she wants more reinforcers in her world, you know? It's nice. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. All right, we're gonna take a short break, and then we're gonna be back with more of your questions, so stick with us. What is autism? 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 <laughs> I've been asking myself that for a very, very long time. Um, let me think about that one. <laughs> um, trying to, uh, just, um... Jeez, let me think. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's a big one. one. Yes. Uh, autism, uh... Autism is a neurological disorder that affects many of our kids in different ways. It's a learning disability that affects the cognitive functions of the brain. A lot of people have the misconception that it's a disability and it's really not. I look at it as like a special gift. When one person thinks differently from another. It's an opportunity for everyone to learn to understand someone that's a little different than them. Autism is the ability to educate. They're given so much talent in different areas. To me, autism means a chance to be with and be around people you really care about. Autism is beautiful. It's a way of seeing the world differently. It's always unique, totally intelligent, and sometimes mysterious. Happiness that that, that comes out of my um, son's um, hard work. It's a movement. Unpredictable. That's right. Awesome. Love. The field I want to work in. Laughter. Fun. Joy. Autism is beautiful to me. I want you to remember these three words. There is hope. Logan Shepard. At first glance, he looks like a typical American teenager. He plays in a band, loves hanging out with his friends, he doesn't like doing homework, and he's not really fond of broccoli. But Logan Shepard is not your typical 14-year-old. Logan was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. He was nonverbal, made no eye contact, and his parents were told to abandon all hope. Instead, his parents began an intensive intervention treatment. At its center was a quality ABA program known as the CARD method. This is Logan Shepard now. All I really want to say is like, I'm kind of copying Martin Luther King. I kind of have a dream like that one day, like I can just like inspire people and never give up. Cause like, that's what I want to do in life. Cause if I can succeed, they can succeed and I will succeed. To follow Logan's musical journey, visit www.facebook.com slash official drummer rock or at drummer rock on Instagram. For more information on the card method, visit www.centerforautism.com or call 800-345-CARD. Rock on, Logan. Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. Somebody just wrote in and said, help, Shannon, you gotta give me more than that. Tell me what you need, like put it in a question form and we're here for you. I want you to know that always, right? Si se puede, we do this together. I'm there for you. Dr. Grampy Shea, I can say your name. I'm here. Just not with, uh, not with these teeth. Uh, <laughs> she's here for you as they well. nothing else? Nothing else. So, oh. so we're listening, we're hearing you. Write back to us, let us know what you need. Please, but, yeah. Uh, but somebody else wrote in and said, I am uh, interested in using skills, but my kid is now in almost 40 hours. He hardly has any time. Are there any other providers who use skills other than CARD? What a great question. Yeah, absolutely. Well, skills is a, uh, it's open to the public, so you should probably just tell your provider. There are other providers, uh, but you can always just refer your provider to skills and they can get an account. 
Um, they can get an account for your child and other children and they can use it. And I, that's what I suggest you do. Or if you already have an account, then just allow your provider to have access and they can use it. Yeah. And if you want to, if you are having ABA with a provider that isn't using skills and you would like for them to know more about skills, you can call the 877-975-4559 number That's right. and ask them to set up a demo for your ABA provider Absolutely. Um, so that they can see the benefits for them. There are crazy benefits for uh, ABA providers to be able to use it because there's a lot of things that are intensive that take time for note taking and preparing. Mm -hmm. documents and stuff it actually it's so inexpensive it will more than pay for itself in in the kinds of things that they will be able to automate and and that, that aren't Absolutely. particularly the fun things let's oh yeah say for that. sure I mean they'll get, and as a provider they'll get uh, you know first of all you can generate reports from it so you yeah. can get all of the IEP reports done it has IEP goals for the provider it has all sorts of training tips and teacher tips it has uh, you know, it connects you to the BIP, so you have access to a, to an indirect functional assessment and a BIP builder. So they have to, a provider has to often write a behavior intervention plan. So it provides that for them very easily. Um, it just not, it has the capability to ha to manage all the other stuff, obviously, like medications, diets, etc. You can put all that information. It now has the ability to receive all of your psych testing so uh, you know any t psych testing that your child has had or iq or language or adaptive testing whatever all those scores go in there so you're it's a really cool it's, a, it's like a medical record system you yeah. know so your provider would have all uh, would be able to ch have your, your child's full picture in there and all of their testing and records and everything so as well as guidance on how to teach the next thing and what to teach and and a lot of the things in skills are the uh you know like the areas of the cognition curriculum and the executive functioning i would say honestly most providers when they see that stuff most a b b c b a's when they see that stuff they're like wow i didn't realize i could use behavioral intervention to teach things such as thinking about something or lying telling jokes you know predicting inferring all that kind of yeah. what we you know mental activities and so they're always pretty astonished and most bcbas that i've whenever a bcba sees a demonstration they're like oh my god this is unbelievable so yeah. i would really recommend you get a demo for them even just you know the, the part where it goes from teaching beliefs to false beliefs um yeah. our world needs that right now our world yeah every, there are so many adults that don't understand that just because someone says something that's their opinion the difference between an opinion and a fact mm -hmm. and because you believe something doesn't make it true and you know i, I mean it's these are gradations of, of things that later th those are th it's a base on which you build things that are intelligent You're right i mean you you can't you can't really get to higher thinking without that kind of critical thinking and right, understanding absolutely. the difference. So important and very, very important. So again, uh, skills, you can go to skillsforautism.com, but if you want to set up a demo, the best number to call, 877-975-4559. Tell them that Shannon and Dr. Doreen sent you. <laughs> so anyway, uh, okay, I want to move on to this next question. I'm really struggling, struggling with my son that has PDD, NOS, and ODD slash ADHD. He is 11 and angry, negative, and disrespectful. He only wants to play games on his computer. I'm nervous for school. I want to support him and his teachers. I know his teachers have a hard time with him and they list disruption, crying, and refusals. Do you have any suggestions for school and or home? We have a meeting with his teachers at the end of the month. He is in a typical elementary school. Thank you. I look forward to learning from your show every week. First of all, we're sending you a hug. Yes, thank right? you so much. And absolutely, air hug, as Sharon yes. says. Oh, gosh. So you have your hands full. Um, I hate the diagnosis ODD. I don't really believe in the diagnosis ODD, which is oppositional defiant disorder. I, I think, I, I don't think it should be classified as a disorder. I think being oppositional and defiant is 
not a, a state. I mean, it's not a trait. It's not a disorder. It's kind of a state of being that that is due to various reasons. ADHD, you know, is like much more. I think uh, if it's accurate, I don't even know. I, I, to some extent, this is just a mishmash of things. So it's kind of like you got to really figure out what's going on with the child. I'm trying to envision this child, and I'm seeing a a very high functioning child, PDDNOS. Uh, you know, so I don't think he has a lot of deficits, but he clearly is having a hard time understanding the rules of society, let's put it that way. And, uh, you know, no child at 11 should be angry and negative and disrespectful because honestly, by at the age of 11, how much have you really experienced from the world to be angry? So let's assume that for whatever reason, what we have here is a child who perceives his own environment as being unfair. So uh, most of the time our children are angry, negative and disrespectful when a couple of things. When one, they see their own environment as being unfair and not that it is unfair, but it, that's how they see it and they have been rewarded by expressing themselves in angry, negative, and disrespectful ways. So in other words, um, and when I say rewarded, I don't mean everybody's been like, oh, good job being angry. What I mean is his anger, his negativity, and his disrespect have gotten him things he wanted. Uh, and, and I'll give you some examples of how that happens. Uh, basically, what happens is uh, he is on the computer, and uh, you know that if you try to stop him, he will uh, cry and tantrum perhaps, and maybe even throw things, say bad things, be disrespectful, be rude, whatever it is. And because of that, you avoid telling him something. Uh, because of the fact that he's angry, people might be walking on eggshells around him and afraid to confront him, afraid to stop him, uh, and that sort of stuff. So in his universe, um, his uh, subconsciously, subconsciously, he's not even aware of this, subconsciously he has come to learn that if I wanted to keep playing on the computer, I just have to be angry, negative, and disrespectful because no one will come mess with me and I'll have the entire day on my own and I can do whatever I want. And so that pattern of behavior has to change. And um, it is harder because he is PDDNOS, perhaps has uh, ADHD. It makes life a little bit harder. But nevertheless, the procedures are the same, and what has to happen is, and here's the, here's the tough part, it starts with not being afraid of him. It starts with uh, being willing to confront that negativity and anger, um, and you just have to, at some point, everyone around him has to come to agreement that you need to take con get control over it. Now, the way that you get control of it or, over it is very, very simple, you, but it's, it's hard to do, but it's theoretically, it's very simple. Uh, he likes computers, play games, okay, that becomes his reinforcer. He only gets that when he is behaving well. The minute that he's not behaving well, he does not get that. The, the, and, you know, being angry, negative, disrespectful, one of the things as a behavior analyst is we don't deal with the emotion that's causing it. We deal with the overt behavior. So when he's angry, what does he do? When he's disrespectful, what is he doing that is disrespectful? I assume he's angry. He might hit. He might throw a tantrum. He might throw objects. He might um, scream and cry being disrespectful, he might say rude things. So, you know, list all of these things and those behaviors, when they occur, he cannot receive a computer. Uh, aside from, or, or play a game. Aside from that, you just live your life. Like, you know, you go about and you, dis, you don't, don't worry about telling him to get off the computer. Tell him to get off the computer whenever it's time to get off the computer. Limit his time. Tell him right off the bat you have, you know, when you come home from school, you will have 
from four to five to be on the computer if you've had a good day at school. If you haven't, too bad. And uh, let him have his tantrum, let him have his, let him whatever it is. And when he's doing that, you put completely isolate him and do not give him attention for that at all. Um, and if he's going to, and it could last several hours, don't be afraid of it. It's not, he, it's a communication. What he's doing is he's tantruming, crying, hitting, so on. And if, if there was language in there, he would be saying, uh, you know, I want my computer back. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to do what you're telling me. I don't want to whatever it is. And the truth of the matter is, if you want him to live in, a, in this society, he has to do certain things when you tell him to do them. So the reality of it is, can you be prepared to ignore his, his anger, negativity, and disrespect and reward him for good behavior? And you'll need to model some of that because he might not even know what good behavior is. And the good behavior is just, you know, doing the things that he's supposed to do, like schoolwork, getting ready on time, going to school, doing his homework, etc. all the stuff we expect of our kids. And then uh, when he uh, has done that, you can reward him with computer time. Uh, he can ask for computer time and you can give it in short increments. But right now, it's, it's your biggest reward, clearly. Use it as a reward. Don't give him free access. Uh, and I know all, everything I said is really hard, but somewhere you have to start. And it really, if he's 11 and has all these different types of behaviors, you're going to need help. So I would suggest that you get a best friend, a sister, a, 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 someone who's going to be there for you to help. And you do it together because, uh, trust me, it's going to get a little chaotic. Like he might try to you know, uh, aggress, he might try to do uh, property damage, he might try to uh, slam doors or that sort of stuff. And you need to make sure perhaps have your husband or your, I don't know if this is a mom or a dad, I don't know why I assumed it's a mom, but whoever, you know, have a, a, a male figure there who would also be able to guide him to his room, assist so that he's not causing any damage during the tantrum, um, you know, just kind of cautiously uh, make sure he's safe, but not interact with him. And you're going to need someone who can give you moral support because this is not easy. And it's not, it, it will be initially bad and it'll start getting better very quickly. Uh, and when I say very quickly, it's like, you know, you do this three days, you let him tantrum for three days, he will realize his tantrums are not working and he'll give up. Now that's what's very, very important. When you put a behavior on extinction, that means when you ignore a behavior. So let's say he gets angry and starts trying to hit you, and you ignore it, like you just block it, right? You walk away, you just block it and walk away. The behavior usually gets worse before it gets better. It's called an extinction burst. And when that, the reason for that is that internally, the individual is thinking to themselves, this tantrum used to work. How come it's not working? I got to, I gotta increase my act a little bit here. I have to get their attention. And so they increase it before they realize this is just not gonna work, I better give up. And that is the process he's gonna go through. Always remember that when he's tantruming, when he's, he might say more rude things. When all of that stuff happens, it is the extinction burst. And it is the, very important that you ignore that. If you give in when it, he's on an accelerated, heightened level of anger or disrespect, you've now reinforced that level. So in the future, it'll be even worse. Do not give in when he does his extinction burst. That is like the most important thing I could tell you. So that's why I'm saying you need, you need support. Can I throw one more lot uh, on this fire? Absolutely, of course. Um, I, of course, in the moment, I cannot remember what his name is, but it's a friend of yours who works with Byron Katie. Uh, Stan. Stan, yes. Mm -hmm. Said something to me a couple of years ago. I got to get Stan uh, Back to on be the on show. the show um, to talk about people. this. But he was talking about, his son is about the same age as mine, and he was talking about the endless battle he was having over the computer games. Because mm -hmm. it's a very real, real thing with our kids. And he said, you know, and I finally I had to step back and look at it with different eyes. And he said, I realized I didn't know enough about what he was doing because there was such, like, anger and 
and you know, this vehemence that would when we tell our kids time's up and they and they're like no you know and I was going through the same thing with my kid and he said so I I decided to sit down and play some of the games he's playing and he was thinking he was going to find out the games are just too violent and they're too you know whatever um, and he said what he realized and he and he shared this with me and it was an aha moment for me too he said it's all in this timer thing and you have to achieve things and you get a certain amount of time and and when they start interacting with other people it's even worse because you have to achieve things as a team and that we will say you know we have to turn the to we have to turn the tv off it's you know we have to turn the computer off uh it's time to go we have to go now and they're in this world that is timed where they're about to achieve something and some of these games it's unrealistic because mm -hmm. they they want you to play for eight hours yeah. and they kind of it's like that you know the thing where it's like oh and now you just completed this thing now you got to get this thing oh my god and it doesn't give them a break to get yes. out yes and I did not know that that mm -hmm. was happening in the games and I sat down with my son and we talked about it and I talked about it with my husband who knows more about video games than I do and mm -hmm. I said you know which games have this and which don't now my son was a little bit older than your son and I don't I don't know like what your son understands but we were able to sit down and figure out and I was able to say to my son because we'd had good ABA and he does have perspective perspective taking I understand you're in this world and this is your time constraint I'm in this world and this is my time constraint how are we going to figure this out together mm -hmm. but when he felt like he was being heard and that I understood finally, oh, you have this. Now he'll come to me if he's going to do something and he'll say, I'm about to start something that will exactly. be at least an hour. Exactly. Do I have that amount of time to That's play? That's fantastic. And I will say to him, no, we have to leave here in 40 minutes. It wouldn't occur to me to give, me a, give him a countdown and say, we're leaving in an hour, but he'll come to me and voice that. And I'll say, you can't do that now, but I'll tell you what, on Sunday, you're going to have some free time, a block of free time, and you'll be able to do that That's awesome. and he says okay and if Stan and Stan said it turned things around with his kid too that he was able to understand understand and that when he says to him we got to go someplace and his son will say dad I'm in a campaign right now he'll say how much time do you need right. and he says I need 10 more minutes and Stan says okay we're gonna give you that 10 minutes and or says I buddy I can't give you that 10 minutes what can we do about it and doesn't just minimize it because yes. to them yes. it feels like something yes. real it's yes. the most real feeling thing to Oh, it is. All. It's unbelievable. In fact, it is real. Like when you look at these games, and it's gonna, it's only gonna get worse because virtual reality is coming oh. in. When you look at these games, they're unbelievable. Like I honestly, sometimes I watch Sonny playing these games, and there's, you know, he he's built his own character. The character even looks exactly like him. It's wow. it's freaky. So the, the thing about it, and thanks for bringing that up, because what I was trying to tell you was like the way you manipulate consequences, and yes. what you're talking about is manipulation of antecedents. And there are two ways that we modify behavior. One is we manipulate consequences, one is we manipulate antecedents. And that is extremely important because it's always about finding out like why is the child engaged so much that he's not willing to let this go? Uh, you know, anger and disrespect and all that sort of stuff is just not acceptable, so you consecrate it. Uh, but the truth is, if you can find out what's causing some of this stuff like what is causing him to be uh i don't know anxious or disrespectful negative angry if it has to do with the games it's really important that you find that out and you're absolutely right um Shan. it's not just there's a time frame where you have to accomplish something there's other people on with you and you have to have the courage to tell them you're leaving yeah. and they do not like it when you leave because their team becomes weaker as you leave. And so it also has to do with like sometimes with Sonny, he'll be like, I can't say no to this guy because he's friends with a Marine who is in the Philippines and they're partners in this game together. Right. And he's like, he just came back from, like, I can't say no to him because, like, he's a, you know, I have to kind of do an hour with him because right. this is his social behavior too. I'm like, Sonny, you're not, like, you know, don't, don't give me <laughs> these excuses. But the truth is, right. you have to be able to put, uh, let other people down. And so that is part of it as well. Yes. Yeah.